everybody, my name is Mike Rose. I'm editor at Gama Sutra. I also write for Kotaku UK and IndieGames.com and a few other places. Um, so I've kind of led you here under false pretenses. The title of this talk is the cheat codes of talking to the press and YouTubers. Um, but of course, there is no such thing. Uh, there is no Konami code. You can just enter and all of a sudden the press and YouTubers will flop to you. Uh, unfortunately, it's sort of hard work to get these people, uh, including myself, to want to talk to you. But I'm hoping I'm going to be able to give you some pointers on, uh, on kind of moving you closer to getting people to, uh, talking about yourself and your game as well. Um, so I mean, first off, it's worth questioning why you even need the press and YouTubers in the first place. Um, so the problem right now is there are just so many games coming out on, on, on mobile, in the App Store, and on Google Play. There's just hundreds of games released every single day. Um, on PC as well, on Steam now, I think there's more games that have come out in 2014 alone on Steam than in 2011, 12, and 13 combined. Um, so it's not just okay to put your game on Steam anymore, you actually need people to be talking about it as well. Um, all of this kind of means that it's just way harder. It was always hard to get people to notice your game and talk about it, but now it's ridiculously difficult to. Um, and standing out from all the other games and kind of putting yourself a level above everybody else is really kind of necessary. Um, and when it comes to YouTubers, of course, like the YouTuber movement, it's not a new thing, but over the last couple of years, it's really become um, kind of a force to be reckoned with. Um, YouTubers really can bring so much exposure to your game, um, kind of a lot more than the traditional press as well, as much as I hate to admit it, um, YouTubers are bringing ridiculous sales spikes, especially if you have things like uh, Kickstarters, um, if you're trying to get through Steam Greenlight with your game. Um, it can be really kind of amazing for you to get covered by a YouTuber. Um, and even if you just get covered by one of the really big YouTubers, it can kind of just make your game a success overnight. Uh, that's really kind of how crazy it is getting covered by one of these people. Um, so just so you don't think I'm talking rubbish, I thought I'd give some examples of, uh, of real life scenarios where YouTubers have kind of made a big difference. Um, so you might know the game Papers, Please by Lucas Pope. Um, that game was trying to, it released on PC and it was trying to get through Steam Greenlight so it could be on Steam. And I think it had been on a couple of months uh, and the press had talked about it a little bit. And it was, it was kind of rising up the ranks. And then uh, two big YouTubers, Total Biscuit and NerdCube, both covered the game. And within a few days it had shot up on, it had so many yes votes on Greenline, and within like a month it had got through Greenline then. Um, so it kind of shows if you're trying to get through Greenline that it would be a really good idea to get covered by YouTubers. Um, Flappy Bird, you might know about this game. Um, it's uh, obviously spent a lot of time at the top of the App Store charts before the developer decided to take it down. Uh, but one thing a lot of people don't know is that um, kind of on the day that it shot up to number one in the App Store charts, um, this giant YouTuber called PewDiePie uh, made a video about it. I think the video got like a million views um, just in a day. And um, strangely enough, the game was then all of a sudden number one in the charts. So you can kind of make a correlation there if you want to. Um, uh, again, it's kind of crazy that one person can suddenly make a game, because I think it was in number one in the App Store charts, uh, at the top of the charts for the next two months then. Uh, so it kind of shows what these people can do. Um, another uh, kind of crazy example, a uh, game, Schools of the Shogun. Um, they, uh, the, the team behind it, they, they hadn't really pushed it a lot in Russia, and uh, then a big Russian YouTuber um, kind of covered the game, made a video about it, got hundreds of thousands of views, and just from that, kind of one guy making this video, uh, the uh, sales of uh, the game was so big in Russia that it's now their second biggest country for sales. Um, and they, they had never, they hadn't marketed in Russia, they hadn't done anything in Russia with the game really, and yet they've got so many sales coming out of it now. Um, and then, go back to Total Biscuit again, there's a game, uh, 10 Second Ninja, that came out. Um, kind of got regular press uh, for the first week that it was out, and then, you know, the, Sales were up at the launch and started to trail off. And uh, then Total Biscuit made a video in the second week. And just in the day after he covered the game, 
uh, he managed, they managed to double sales of the game just from his one video compared to the whole launch week. Um, so again, hopefully these examples are proving it to you. Um, I have many, many more examples. Um, so the question then is why not just go straight to the YouTubers if they're bringing in so much more traffic than the press? And the number one reason is because the place where most YouTubers choose their games from to cover is from the press. So YouTubers, the big ones, um, are going to Kotaku and Rock Paper Shotgun and Polygon, etc. That's where they're finding the games that they talk about. So you could kind of see it as um, the press are being the curators for the YouTubers, um, which is obviously kind of crazy. And it's, it's horrible for me to say, well, this is, I'm traditional press, and the reason to talk to me is so that YouTubers will cover your game. That's really the reality of it now. Um, so, in that case then, let's talk about how to get um, the, uh, the press to cover your game. Um, so the problem with trying to get the press to cover your game is that they get dozens and dozens of emails and tweets and everything every single day. Um, I mean, I kind of receive probably about 80 plus emails a day, and it's really, really difficult because obviously it's not just emails that I'm going through, I'm also doing news, I'm doing features, I'm watching Twitter. Um, emails are only a portion of what I'm doing. So you, you kind of, when you're sending emails, you need it to be that your email is popping up for me higher than everybody else. You need to be standing out from all the other ones that I'm receiving. So I'm gonna tell you about a thing that I uh, call the hook, line and sinker, which is an absolutely terrible name, but I don't care. Uh, the hook um, starts as an angle or story that sets you and your game apart from everybody else. So it's not just enough to say, oh, I've made a tower defense game for iOS and it's got this name, because that's not interesting. There are dozens of other people who are also making that very same description of a game. So you can't just say that and hope the press are going to cover you from that. What you need is something that makes your tower defense game on iOS more interesting than everybody else. It's that hook that is going to pull people in. So the best way to think about this is, if you were a press person and uh, you, you got that email about that game, what exactly is it that you're going to report on? Because the press aren't going to report on, here is new game from new studio. They're going to report on, here is new game, and this is what is interesting about it. So if you imagine what the headline is going to be, because that headline is going to be your hook, if you imagine what is that headline going to be and am I actually going to click on it? Because that's what a press person is thinking about. They're trying to decide, well, you know, can I bring in hits from covering this person? As horrible as that sounds, that's, that's how it works. Um, so imagine I picked you out now, would you be able to give that elevator pitch? In just in 10 seconds, would you be able to make me interested in your game? If you don't think you'll be able to do that, then you need to have a really hard think about what it is that your game is doing that is interesting because it's really, really important for getting people to talk about it. So once you've decided on what that hook is, then you're going to need people to actually know who you are. So even before you, know, you, you start talking about your game, etc., you can make people aware of you and it makes it so much more likely that they are going to cover you. Um, the best way to do this is probably through Twitter. If you don't have a Twitter account, then you should go and get one, like right now, while I'm talking, you should do it now. Um, and just add just every press person, every video game press person, all the YouTubers, other developers as well, and just start getting into conversations with them. Um, I mean, it will take a while. It's not like you're going to suddenly become a, a somebody in a couple of matter of days. It's going to take months. It's probably going to take years, unfortunately. Um, but the sooner you start it, the better it is. Because if you imagine that you're coming to the point where you want to talk about your game now, and you're emailing me or you're talking to me on Twitter, if I already know, if I already know who you are or at least recognize your name, the chances that I am going to then check you out are greatly improved. Um, so if you imagine then that you have your hook and you have this kind of at least vague recognition with me as well, the chances that I'm going to cover you just vastly improve compared to you know, an email that I receive which is sort of not really got an interesting angle and I have no idea who the person is. Um, that's sort of the way to do it. It's, it's not going to guarantee you success, but it will at least help you to raise above everybody else in terms of just getting the press's attention. 
Um, so just little bits and pieces about the actual getting in touch bit. Uh, this might sound really strange, um, but just be a real person. I know that sounds like, well, yeah, of course, of course I do that. But you'd be surprised at how many people try to act like they're massive corporations. Someone like you know, Ubisoft, they send out press releases because they're a massive company and they're made up of so many people. You don't need to do that. You're an individual or you're a small team. You can so easily use your personality to, to kind of get through and make people recognize you as this really interesting thing to cover. So um, as, as horrible as it sounds, the, a really good thing to do is just to email each press person individually and use their name as well. Um, using a person's name is kind of, you, you wouldn't believe how much more it helps. Um, if I receive an email that just kind of says, dear Gamma Sutra, or hello press person, or something awful like that. Um, if, if I get an email that says, hey Mike, kind of, oh, how are you, etc. cetera, um, that just, it works really well. It's just a psychological thing. It makes me actually want to check out what else you have to say. Um, and so it kind of, to tie into that, it's the idea of talking to me, not at me. So talking at me is just blasting out this sort of um, you know, generic email that's obviously been mass spam to all the press. Um, it doesn't often work unless you're already a bigger company. So you really want to be using the kind of personal angle to talk to the press. Um, the, the thing about this is though, try not to fake it. And by that I mean, don't sort of check out a press person, go on their Twitter, just see what they've been doing in the last week. Oh, they went to this place. I'm going to mention that in an email because it comes across as really kind of fake. Um, just obviously, if you've been doing what I said earlier, following people on Twitter, then you should always already kind of have a, a repertoire with them and that will make it so much easier. Uh, don't spam on Twitter as well. I see people just sending the same message over and over and over again to as many people as they can. That's, it's, really obvious that you're doing that, especially if I just click on your name and see you're doing that. Um, it comes across as really horrible, so yeah, try not to do that. Um, the, the overall idea is just to be a genuine person. Um, that's what the press wants to cover. They want stories about genuine developers who are making interesting games. Um, so just use your personality to your advantage. So I thought I'd just quickly put together um, nothing too in-depth about sending an email. But the general idea about sending emails to the press is that you just want to keep it as short as possible. So you just want to introduce yourself, show them what the hook about your game is, what that special angle is, and then just give them a code for the game, give them a link to a YouTube video, and everything else at the end of it. Make it short as possible. We're talking maximum three paragraphs. That's all you need. Because again, the press has so many emails. Um, they, they, they're just looking for just quick information so that they can cover it. If you send them blocks of text, they're just not going to read through all of that. It's kind of a waste of effort. Um, when it comes to just giving them a code, just give the code. Don't ask, hey, would you like a copy of my game? Because the chances are they're not going to email you back and then they didn't get your game. If you just send them a Steam code or a link to download your game or an App Store code, they just have it then they may well grab it and just have it on their desktop. They might play it later. Um, if, you, if you just give them that code immediately, the chances that they're actually going to play it are so much higher. Um, if you have a Kickstarter, do not leave the email with a Kickstarter. I know it sounds like maybe you should, but it's an important thing to you. That's not a thing to lead with because the press hate Kickstarters now. <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was a thing you know, a couple of years ago, it was an interesting thing. We get so many Kickstarters now, but the best way to get your Kickstarter covered is to lead with your game. Because that's the bit that we're interested in. We're not interested in covering a Kickstarter, we're interested in covering an interesting game. And we will also mention the Kickstarter. So if that is a thing that you are looking to push or you're looking to do soon, just keep that in mind. It's not that you should be pushing the Kickstarter campaign, it's that you should be pushing your game that also has a Kickstarter. Um, and a, a thing that can immediately put people off is a subject line, just a big bulky subject line, or one where someone's put urgent or breaking or something um, awful like that at the start of it. If you're going to do, um, if you're doing a subject line, 
just make it really simple, just name of your game and what the hook about the game is. Or just a little, just a, a very short thing about your studio and where you're from. You just, again, it's, it's a bit like the whole headline thing. You're using something like a subject line to just try and capture attention. So read your subject line back and think, if I was a press person, would I be clicking on this email? Um, some common mistakes that people make uh, with uh, talking to the press. So one which is kind of baffling, really, is that so many developers decide it's a good idea to make their website this horrible maze that I have to go around. Um, so they'll kind of hide their email address so I can't find it. They will make it so that uh, when I'm trying to get screenshots of their game, uh, they, they kind of have this scrolling thing where I click on it and then it pops up on the screen and I can scroll through the, mess, the, the uh, Im images, but I can't right click on it and just download. Um, just make your website so easy to use. It doesn't have to be fancy, it just has to be like, functional and just there for me to find easily. Um, there's a, a thing that you can use called PressKit from, uh, from Grammiat of Lambian. Uh, if you go and find that, it's, it's sort of a template that you can use on your website, which just looks the same as every other press kit. But because the press know how to use this template, it's really easy to find everything in it. Also make sure that you don't miss anything out as well. So it's well worth going and, uh, and using that. Um, like I mentioned, don't lead with, with Kickstarter campaigns. Green light campaigns as well, that's leading or using a subject line with a green light is just not a good idea. Again, mention it at the end of the email once you've actually talked about your game. Uh, and again, don't ask if somebody wants the game, just give it to them. It, just, it means that there is far more chance that they are actually going to play your game. Because the chances are if you ask whether they want the game, they're not going to email you back. Um, people who write about games, obviously do, but it is the thing that they spend all their time doing. So, so typos um, are really off-putting. As, as awful as it sounds, you just really need to make sure that you proofread everything, because if someone does this for a living, then this is going to be elevated in their minds when they spot something like this. And it's all, always worth um, just staying polite as well. So I know there'll be situations where um, you're kind of be angry at press people. I get angry at press people all the time. Um, I mean, there's situations that have arisen where, you know, someone's written a bad review or a preview of a game, and then the developer has kicked off and got really angry at them. Uh, the problem there is that then when people then come to find the review, they just see the developer looking really angry and sort of casts them in a bad light. The best thing to do is just always be polite about it. Um, it's kind of a life uh, tip, really. Uh, because if you're always polite, then when someone comes to find the review and see you being polite in the comments, or if you email a press person saying, oh, thank you for the review, it's really, you know, it's, I, I wish you'd enjoyed it more, but oh well, we'll try again next time. The press person is going to remember that. I've had people where I've, I've written a, a bad review of one of their games, and they've emailed me saying, oh, we, we hope that maybe next time the next game will be good. And, uh, and I've, I've remembered them for that. And then when they have brought out our next game, I've gone and checked it out. So it's just always a good idea to do it. And just kind of responding in a bad way is never a good idea, especially on the internet. <laughs> so uh, we talked about talking to the press. So what about YouTubers then? Um, so of course, I said earlier, the YouTubers are looking to the press to find all their games. Um, but YouTubers are also picking games up from other places. The number one place, unfortunately, is that they pick it up from other YouTubers. Um, so they'll, uh, they'll kind of, a lot of YouTubers, especially the big ones, all kind of know each other. And they'll be watching what all the other YouTubers cover, and they'll be covering that as well. That might not sound that useful to you, um, but I'll, I'll kind of talk later about why it maybe is. Um, other places that YouTubers are finding games, uh, so the front page of Steam is where a lot of YouTubers are picking up PC games. Um, that's of course not so useful now with the, uh, with the new Steam Discovery update that happened recently. It means that it's a lot more difficult to work out how to actually get onto the front page of Steam. Um, but of course that's probably a talk for another day. Um, social media is a big place where YouTubers are picking up games, um, especially Twitter. Um, it will be press people, it'll be other YouTubers, but it'll also be developers 
Um, a lot of YouTubers cover developers they like, and if they see that developers are talking a lot about a game, they may go and check it out. Kind of goes back to, again, um, when you're on Twitter, kind of conversing with other developers and kind of making a community out of it as well. Um, it's always a good idea because if you can get a lot of developers on your side, when it comes to actually talking about your game, a lot of them will support you on that. And um, hopefully, uh, YouTubers will spot it. Um, if you're not familiar with Reddit, then I apologize. I'm about to ruin your life. Um, you, you need to learn how to use Reddit because uh, a lot of YouTubers pick up games from Reddit. There's specific subreddits that they will um, pick up games from, things like the gaming subreddit, game subreddit, game dev subreddit, uh, indie gaming. Um, if this is all going over your head, um, then you just need to work out what is going on with Reddit. It's really very simple. It's basically just a giant forum where people are upvoting and downvoting things. Um, but it's well worth getting into it because uh, it can have a big impact. And the, the bigger YouTubers um, focus on emails. The, the smaller YouTubers don't so much, um, but there's a, there's a reason for that. Um, YouTubers don't get any emails. Um, even the bigger YouTubers don't get that many. So you can kind of see here, this is from some surveys uh, that I've done recently. Uh, on the left is how many emails YouTubers are getting on average each day. And on the right is how many emails the press get. So you can kind of see YouTubers, the vast majority of YouTubers aren't even getting 10 emails. Um, the bigger ones are getting kind of 20 or less. There's a couple who are getting more than that, but mainly it's not very many emails. I mean, I don't know about you, but if I was getting sort of less than 20 emails a day, I would be an extremely happy person. Um, the press, on the other hand, are getting ridiculous amounts, kind of up to 80 and more every day. Um, kind of the average seems to be around 40 of how many uh, press people are getting. So the thing is that it kind of leaves a gap for you here, right? Because if YouTubers aren't getting any emails, then the chances are that if you email them, they are going to spot your email and they are going to read it. Um, so it's really kind of interesting um, that this is happening. And while people aren't realizing that no one is emailing YouTubers, you need to be doing it and using that gap. So the thing about emailing YouTubers is that YouTubers don't care so much about the hook that we were talking about earlier. Because obviously the press, they're writing an article, they need a headline. YouTubers, they don't need a headline. They need an interesting video that is going to be watched by lots of people. Um, and they just sort of need your game right now. They need it immediately so that they can start checking it out. Because they don't care about any words you have to say about it. They just want to see what it looks like in action. Because that's what their whole business is about. Um, so you can kind of see what I've done here is, is put the same kind of layout of email that I did with the press, except um, crossed out what's your hook. That doesn't mean don't talk about your hook. It's more like fold it into the introduction. Don't go so hard on, on that hook because what YouTubers really need is a code to download your game and a, a, a video of what the game looks like, whether that's trailers or gameplay footage. Because at the end of the day, if they kind of check out your video and they think, hey, that looks like it would fit on my channel, that's the one thing that you're hoping they are going to think. Um, so the problem with emailing YouTubers is that it's really difficult to actually find their contact details. A lot of YouTubers sort of bury their emails in their YouTube channel about page somewhere. Um, a lot of them don't even seem to have email addresses or at least haven't put them out there. And uh, it's more about kind of trying to talk to them on Twitter or hoping that they pick it up. Um, fortunately, this guy called uh, Thomas Bedenk at Brightside Games, um, he kind of spent six months or something ridiculous just finding all of the contact details and information for YouTubers bit by bit. Uh, and has put together this giant Google Doc. It has thousands of, uh, of, the, of contact information for YouTubers in it. Uh, I've put the link there. Uh, if you go on that link, you'll, you'll find that you can't actually see the contact information immediately. You need to email him to ask for permissions for it. Um, but he's, he's very open to, to people uh, kind of sharing on it. So um, yeah, it's 100% it's worth doing this because it's really kind of important. Um, so I was saying earlier that smaller YouTubers don't really get any emails. 
And of course, you might kind of ask, well, is it actually worth bothering with them? So when I say smaller YouTubers, I'm kind of talking about people who have, let's say, 5,000 subscribers or less on YouTube. They're probably getting a couple hundred views on each video. So it might seem like maybe it's not worth going with them and you might as well just kind of go straight to the top and try and get you know, these people like Total Biscuit, et cetera, to, to cover your game. Um, but the thing is that it turns out a lot of these smaller YouTubers are being watched by the bigger YouTubers. I mean, this happens in the press as well, you know, kind of new and upcoming press people appear, the bigger names in the press start to notice them. Um, and will kind of follow them on Twitter, watch their work, cover stuff that they're covering. Um, this happens all the time and it happens with YouTubers as well. Um, so it's not a very good idea to discount them because just because they're only getting small numbers of views on their videos doesn't mean that there aren't other people watching who may well bring you a lot more traffic. The thing is as well, um, is that a lot of these smaller YouTubers will actually bring in as much traffic as kind of a medium-sized press outlet. So if you're hitting up all the press, then it really makes sense to be hitting up these smaller YouTubers as well, because they'll probably bring just as many hits to your game as, as, the, as these kind of medium-sized press can as well. Um, giving your game to smaller YouTubers as well can help because it can kind of show you what your game looks like when it's being played. Um, you might not, it, of course, you can record videos yourself, but you have no idea how people are going to respond. There's loads of situations where people have released games, uh, and then YouTubers have started to do crazy things with them. They started to do speed runs here, try and break the game there. Um, so kind of giving your game to these smaller YouTubers can really help you to see what it is that YouTubers are going to do with your game. So one of the big problems for YouTubers is that they will like a game and they will go to try and record stuff about the game and they will find that they're just having issues. And it's a bit like with the press, you know, sort of having an issue with a game and just thinking, oh, well, I've got loads of other games to cover. YouTubers, if they find they've got recording issues, they're not going to spend more than, you know, kind of five minutes trying to fix them. They're just going to kind of move on and cover another game instead. The best way to stop this from happening is just to record your own game in as many different recording softwares as possible. Just try it out and see what it, if it works or not. So I've kind of compiled a list of the, the popular programs that a lot of YouTubers use. Um, if you kind of grab a copy of all of these, just put your game into it, make sure it actually works. Um, it, it doesn't make any sense, right, for this to be the thing that the reason why a YouTuber doesn't cover your game just because it doesn't record properly. It seems like a, a crazy reason for them to stop um, if you can quite easily solve this just by fixing it yourself. If your game is awkward to record, so say something like a local multiplayer game, right? It's kind of difficult for a YouTuber to cover that unless they can kind of get a bunch of people around to their house. Even online multiplayer games can be difficult at times because they've got to get other people online all at the same time and they've got to work out a way that they're going to record other people's voices if they're doing that. Um, again, it doesn't mean don't make these kind of games. It's just more an explanation for why maybe you might find it difficult to get a YouTube to cover your game. Um, something that is a bit more solvable um, is that uh, a lot of YouTubers will say that they will just not play a game if they find the controls are poor or that there are kind of these horrible difficulty spikes in the middle of a game. So you can imagine if a YouTuber is playing a game, they're thinking, yeah, I might want to record this, and then they get to a part in your game where all of a sudden they just can't beat this bit. The problem there is that nobody wants to sit and watch someone struggling over a bit of a game for half an hour. And a YouTuber doesn't particularly want to sit there and look silly as well, because it is going to make them look a bit silly if they're just sat trying to be a part of a game. Um, so if you do have any parts like this, especially early on in your game, it's a good idea to try and stamp them out because YouTubers um, just probably aren't going to be happy about it. Um, another thing that's kind of impossible to solve really is that certain games are fun to play, but then they're kind of boring to watch. Um, I mean, I'd say something like Civilization or Diablo or something like that. I sit and I play those games for hours, but I don't think I'd sit and watch people play them. Um, I'm sure there are lots of people who do, uh, but obviously it's 
there's, there's games, things like roguelikes um, are games that a lot of people like to watch um, and will watch for hours and hours just because they can be really interesting. They've got the random uh, elements to them. Um, so if your game is like that, again, it's not saying don't make games like that. It's more saying that you might struggle to get some of you YouTubers to cover you. Um, and the, uh, the other thing is that uh, your game might be on a platform or in a genre that they don't cover. Um, so when it comes to platforms, um, I've kind of, again, I've been asking YouTubers the kind of platforms that they do cover. And uh, I, I thought it was interesting to just find out whether they actually do want to cover, you know, kind of Kickstarters and Greenlights, etc. So Kickstarters, uh, the majority of YouTubers will cover Kickstarters. The problem is that they actually need something to play. So if you have a Kickstarter and you don't have a game yet and it's for funding the game, then you're going to have a problem because, of course, YouTubers need something to actually record. They can't make a video of nothing. So if you don't actually have a playable build or a prototype for this Kickstarter game that you're making, then the chances that YouTubers are going to cover it is, uh, is kind of slim. Um, a lot of the bigger YouTubers as well say that they just don't cover Kickstarters at all uh, because I guess they've kind of been burned in the past where they've covered Kickstarters and then the Kickstarters kind of burned out or maybe the game that came out of it wasn't so good and uh, the YouTubers feel like you know, they feel like they had an obligation to, to show their, their viewers good games and now they've kind of failed on that. Um, so if you, if you are trying to get a Kickstarter covered by YouTubers, um, then it's uh, it obviously hits up everybody, but don't be too disheartened if the, the big names aren't covering you. Um, Greenlight games, uh, YouTubers will cover Greenlight games. Um, again, they need something to play, and preferably a released game. I mean, of course, there's, there's, I guess there's two different ways to use Greenlight. Either you put your game up on Greenlight before it's actually ready, um, kind of in preparation for being on Steam, or your game has already been released. Um, if you're in a situation, situation where your game's already been released, YouTubers will cover your game. It doesn't matter to them that it's not on Steam, because a lot of them actually like the idea that they're helping people out, helping people to get through Greenlight and finding these gems. Um, so if you are running a, a, a green light or planning to, then uh, yeah, YouTubers will cover your game. Um, same with Steam Early Access. Uh, there are some YouTubers who choose not to cover Early Access games at all, but the vast majority of them will, as long as there's, again, a game for them to play. Um, we're talking some actual content, so obviously there's a lot of games that come out on Steam Greenlight that will maybe have 20 minutes, half an hour of, of gameplay there. Um, at, the, at the beginning, um, a lot of YouTubers say that they want an hour of content in a uh, in a Steam Greenlight, uh, sorry, in an early access game before they will uh, actually check it out. Of course, if you have an early access game, you're kind of updating it every now and again. Um, it's always worth if if YouTubers haven't covered you already. It's always worth trying them again every time that you do kind of a hefty update to your game. Um, so when it comes to mobile, uh, the the problem is that not many YouTubers cover mobile games. Um, you can see the, uh, on the right there, the, uh, the, the kind of giant blue bar on the left there is how many YouTubers say no, they never cover mobile games. I think it turned out it was about 90% of the people that I surveyed. Uh, so it kind of seems like sending mobile games to YouTubers isn't worth it. Um, but you should still try, because there are still YouTubers who do cover mobile games. And of course, because there's so few of them, it means that the chances are that they're going to see your game if you send it to them. Um, there's also a way to try and get some of the bigger YouTubers to, uh, to cover your mobile game, and that is to send it them in a way you know, that they can actually play it. So one of the big problems, one of the big reasons why YouTubers don't cover mobile games is because they just don't have the capacity, they don't have the software to do it, they don't have the hardware to record, um, if you have a browser version, you know, I see a lot of times people are making mobile games and they have a browser version of their game. Or even if you just have a PC build that you can send to YouTubers who normally cover PC games, um, the chances that they are going to cover it obviously greatly improve. Um, of course, there are certain games that lend themselves better to YouTube videos. So we're mentioning Flappy Bird earlier. Um, obviously, that was just a one-button game. Just 
tapping, could have been tapping on the keyboard, could have been tapping on the mouse. Um, if you have games which lend themselves well to, uh, to kind of PC controls, and that's great. Obviously, some games don't, which are heavily touch screen. It's going to make it a little bit more difficult. Um, but I've put up the link just at the bottom there. I've kind of made a, a tiny URL to a, uh, a Google Doc that has, um, I think it has about 70 YouTubers who cover mobile games. So um, it's, it's still worth doing that if you're making a mobile game. So when should you really be thinking about putting all of this into action? Um, well, the answer is right now, or yesterday, if that's possible. Um, again, if you don't have a Twitter account, do get one. Um, you, you might have up to this point thought, oh, there's no point, I'm not going to be using it. But honestly, that's what everybody who has not used Twitter yet thinks. And the moment that you get into Twitter, you realize that it's taking over your life. And it's awful, but it's also great at the same time. Um, so uh, you just need to get on Twitter. A good way to work out who to follow, just um, kind of see the people who I'm following. So I'll, I'll put up my Twitter handle at the end. Um, and just look at the list of the people I'm following and just follow all of them because I, I believe that I follow useful people in the industry. Um, so they can be useful people for you as well. Uh, and when you get to the point where you have enough content to kind of show off your game, just start doing it. Start doing it as early as possible. Don't hold it back because there is no good time to do it. Once you have enough game to show, then you want to start telling people about it. Uh, so a lot of the time, it's normally when you can make a decent video out of it. When you think you can make a video that looks exciting, then that's going to be exciting to other people. So that's really a really good point to start talking about your game. And like I've been saying, it's all about just making a name for yourself. Uh, it's not going to happen immediately. It's going to take ages, and it's going to be a slog, just like it is for everybody. Um, there are only small numbers of developers who just blow up like that. Um, the majority of the developers kind of, you know, who, who you kind of maybe look up to or you see as important people, at one point they, with, they, nobody knew about them and they were making, they were probably making small games that no one was covering. Um, it's all about just keep going at it, keep trying to make a name for yourself uh, until people start to listen. Um, so I think I've uh, made everything uh, that I was going to say, so thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Mike. And we have um, just over 10 minutes for questions. So, есть ли у кого вопросы? У нас есть куча вопросов. Давайте начнем вот здесь. Hi. Hey. Uh, what do you think about the argument that these days it's not enough making a good game and having a pitch for this game, but you have to have a story to go along with it, especially if you're an indie and especially if the game is not released yet, like some Kickstarter or Dreamlight. Story about how game was developed, studio. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, I I mean, I started kind of covering games in about 2007, I think, and I think I started kind of heavily covering um, indie games in about 2009. And back when I was doing that, um, I got so few games that I could pretty much cover every single thing that was being sent to me as long as I liked it. Um, I was probably getting three or five emails a day. Um, and back when that was happening, it wasn't as important to have, a, you know, like you say, like this kind of interesting story about where it came from, because people just kind of were desperate to cover games. Um, now, like I say, there's, there's so many games coming out every day. It's, it's kind of, it makes it really difficult to choose the ones that you are going to cover. So having that interesting story, I mean, when we say interesting story, it's not like you have to have this crazy story about where a game came from, you know, that, that has well, dozens of chapters, etc. We're just, we're just talking just an interesting little tidbit every now and again about, you know, what happened, where, where, when, why did you start making the game, and where did you start making the game, and what were you doing before that, etc. Um, it's just little things like that. Just a, a good way to do it is just kind of talk to friends about it, ask them what do you think is interesting about what it is that I'm doing, and they will help you kind of decide the, the actual parts of your story that they might actually get covered by the press. 
You want to throw a t-shirt his way? Oh, I've got to throw it. Should I throw it? Yeah. Okay, throw it. Let's, it let's check your aim. You ready? Oh, stolen. Oh, oh come on, that's not. All right, um, next question, right there. Hello, thank you for lecture. Uh, my name is Julia, and uh, we produce games. Uh, so the question is, uh, uh, of course we wanted our games to be reviewed on your site. So what should be the topic? What? So what should be the email subject so that you notice our game and uh, we receive the desirable answer? So when you say subject, you mean... Um, what should, we notice, uh, what should we write in the subject? Of in, the, the in the subject line? Yeah. Of an email. Um, so, a good way to do it is just to make it really simple. So, for example, name of your game, cola, and then just six or seven words about what make it interesting. You, you, you kind of, you want to be, with every single thing you do, you want to be trying to make the distance between me, you sending the game out, and me finding it interesting as small as possible. So if you can make a really interesting subject line, which just really quickly kind of explains what your game is about, then I've already seen it, and I can kind of go through to click on it then. Um, Maybe you can tell what was uh, the main uh, interesting topic you received in the subject of the mail. An interesting one. Um, I'll tell you, there was, there was one recently actually, um, which was kind of interesting and stuck with me. Um, there was a guy uh, who made a game called Impossible Road that was on mobile. And um, this is kind of a bit strange, but it worked. He, uh, he, he basically started sending out emails where the subject line was, was just like a number. So I think it started just with five. He just sent just the subject line five to everybody. So I clicked it because it's the number five, I want to know what that is. And then the email was just like a graphic of the number five. And then a couple of days later, he sent out four. And then a couple of days later, he sent out three. And by the end of the week, I'm wondering what this is going to be. Uh, and at the end of the week, he kind of releases his game and has an email with information about it. Um, thinking outside the box like that can work. Sometimes it can be, you know, you have to watch out, it can be a little weird if someone is doing some, you know, some kind of trying to do, do a viral thing like that. Sometimes they backfire. Um, but if you can think of an interesting way to do that, because obviously if he just sent an email on release day saying, here is my game, maybe it might have got lost with all the other games that have been released that day. But because of this strange kind of tactic that he'd taken, um, got to the point where I, I wanted to know what this countdown was, was counting down to. So, um, yeah, I guess, yeah, that's one example of, of where you could do what you could do with a subject line, really. Okay, what are the trails? Oh, no. Went terrible last time. Right, hang on. This is going to go further. All right, come on, come on. Oh, it's in the drinks. Almost. All right, uh, we have time for three more questions and three more teachers. Uh, we're going to do no question. All right, so we got a question right there. So, uh, hey. Thank you, Mike, for the very interesting topic. And uh, the question was, uh, you talked about the line. You talked about uh, that it's very helpful to be recognized before sending out emails to the press and YouTubers and so on, if I got it right. Um, so the question is, what about uh, some of the uh, big names that became big after the release? For example, Notch or Philfish. Uh, have you heard something about them before their releases, or uh, these are just these rare examples of being, becoming famous overnight? Yeah, I mean, so when it comes to the people who kind of got big after their game release, um, the vast majority of these examples, I think, are kind of outliers, they're, they're exceptions. Um, in, a, in a lot of cases, I had already heard about people. So for example, Notch, like I, I'd already talked to him a lot before Minecraft um, and, and kind of, you know, we were aware of him. Um, again, it's, it's difficult there because that was years and years ago. That was like five years ago now. Um, and it was a lot different back then. I mean, it was a lot easier to kind of get noticed. Um, but 
I think the examples of people kind of just becoming big just from making a really good game and really not actually doing that much marketing um, are, are kind of slim. I mean, I guess a, a, a recent one where that's happened, you could say, is um, like the you know Steam World Dig. Um, those guys didn't really do a massive amount of of publicity for it. Um, it just so happened that the press kind of started to slowly pick up this game to the point where a lot of people start to hear about it. Um, but I would I would strongly advise kind of not leaving it to chance. Really, you know, if, if you're in a position where you shout about your game before it's released, then should really do it, right? Really. So. Thank you. Okay, so uh, next question. Uh, a person over there wanted to ask one in Russian. Uh, so I'll just translate. Go ahead. Добрый день. Если я правильно понял идею, то самое главное это начать рекламировать свой продукт еще до релиза. И вопрос такой: за какое время вы хотя бы примерно начать рекламировать и не потеряете ли эффект? Um, so there is no, there is no specific time. Like there is no kind of it should be six months or etc. Um, it's kind of different for for everybody. Um, what I like to say is that a good time to start talking about your game is as early as you feel comfortable to do that. So if you're at the point where you have made enough of your game that you think it's interesting um, and you think that the press are going to find it interesting and people are going to see it and think, yeah, I, I, I can kind of get into that, that is probably the time when you want to do it. it really, the answer is um, as early as is possible. But if you don't have anything to show yet, then that's not a good time. Um, and when it comes to kind of you know spoiling it, I don't. I, I I think again, I think there are exceptions where that has happened, but there, there's not many. I would I would say probably as early as possible, really. Okay, uh, we got time for one last question somewhere else in the hall. Just so more, uh, there's a question right there at the end. Uh, on середине, on середине. Нет, дальше, дальше, дальше. Рядом с камерой. Да, да. Ой, Hello, Mike. Hey. Uh, I have a question. If, uh, for example, a developer is still not ready to show his game like, widely, yeah. is it still wise to send the, the playable version to some YouTubers before they can like, publicly release a video, for example, so they can go uh, there, you check it out, and whatever uh, else? So, there have been situations where people have, have done this, um, including to myself, um, where a developer has kind of said, will you check this out and let me know. Um, if you're hoping to do that, then a good idea is to find people in the press who are kind of receptive to that kind of thing. So, so like I say, like, I, I'm a person, I, I like to, I, I like the idea of like, Helping out new new studios, um, that's kind of a, a big thing for me. So, and there's lots of people like me who like to do that kind of thing. Um, so, if you can find these people who are, are kind of receptive to to taking on um, early builds to let you know what they think, um, then yeah, sure, it's it's a it's a decent idea. The the only thing I'd say is, you know, obviously kind of don't go crazy with it because if you send out you know a really early bill to loads of people and they're all a bit don't know about this then that might kind of taint it later on it might mean that they'll see it and think oh that was that game that I saw really early on and I didn't particularly love um, and they might just choose to not cover the game off that so so yeah I would say it's a it's a good idea but be but be careful with it find the people who are going to actually you know, take that on well. Thank you.